Welcome to the Work Done Right podcast, where we talk with industry professionals to discuss best practices in construction, manufacturing, and maintenance. I am your host, Wes Edmiston, Director of Product with Cumulus Digital Systems and 15-year construction industry veteran. Our guest today is Dr. Nina Dadlez. Dr. Dadlez is the Associate Chief Medical Officer at Tufts Medical Center and a pediatrician. In her position, she is working with other leaders across Tufts to progress the institution on its HRO journey, as well as co-leading a quality improvement and safety training program targeting all 7,000 employees across Tufts Medical Center. Dr. Dodlez is a strong proponent of patient safety, family-centered care, and evidence-based medicine. She is interested in rigorously investigating pediatric patient safety and quality improvement. Her research focuses on reduction of medication prescribing errors, diagnostic errors, and safe transitions of care throughout the medical system. She is passionate about using data-driven performance improvement methods to fuel organizational change. She has served as a quality improvement coach for a national quality improvement collaborative to reduce diagnostic errors, and in another to improve the use of evidence-based medicine. Dr. Dodlez of attended the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, and completed her pediatric residency training at Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. She completed a pediatric hospital medicine fellowship at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, where she studied quality improvement methodology and obtained a master's in clinical research methods at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Dr. Dodlez, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me today, Wes. Excited to be here. Yeah, I am thrilled to have you here. I'm very excited for this conversation. I've been actually talking with with a lot of different people leading up to this just because I've been really excited to do this. Uh, So before we get started on, I guess, the bulk of our conversation, though, I'd like to do just a little bit of level setting because much of our audience might not be aware of what a associate chief medical officer does. So could you describe a bit to our audience kind of what it is that you do and what the mission of your position is? Sure. Um, So I'm the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Quality at Tufts Medical Center, uh, which means really that I have oversight over our quality and safety practices, both for patients and employees across the organization. Um, I really partner with other leaders across the organization. A lot of the work that we do is multidisciplinary, so working with other physician and nurse leaders, our public safety officers, employee health, um, our environmental services team, so that we can all work together to give the best care that we can give to patients. Thank you for that excellent description. Uh, now, some of our audience is likely wondering, I guess, why we would have somebody like yourself on the show, given that our backgrounds are quite different. Uh, but, you know, as, as we talked once before and, you know, kind of just as I've been doing a little bit of research, kind of looking around at some of the overlap between the industrial oil and gas sector and the medical industry, it seems like we actually have a good amount of overlap. I mean, we, we're, we're both providing assurance to the highest quality of service so that the folks down the line from us are, are safe and that, that they're able to go home at the end of the day, right? Uh, do you see similarities between, I guess, the medical industries and the industrial sector and what can we learn from one another. I was so excited to be invited because honestly, we've learned so much about um, how we practice quality and safety in medicine from industrial engineering. Um, And really a lot of the practices that we're bringing things like standardization, having safe checklists, really making sure that we're debriefing and learning from every error that happens in the system uh, are originating in, um, in industrial engineering and thinking about human factors and how it influences the way we work. Um, So I I feel like we've learned so much from your industry and was excited to have the opportunity to come and speak about it with you today. Perfect. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in diving in a little bit deeper on that because, because, you know, you keep saying quality and safety at the same time. And, you know, whenever, whenever I was uh, a foreman, just running crews, right. I would always tell my, 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 uh, my folks that, the quality of work that you do directly influences the the safety of the person that's going to be operating this facility. And by the sounds of it, you know, it's very much married together in your industry as well. Uh, so with that kind of interrelated correlation between the two, do you have any, I guess, stories from your industry, obviously all things HIPAA considered, uh, but something that, that well, uh, I guess, demonstrates that uh, the relationship between safety and quality in your industry? 
Sure. Um, so we, we really use data um, in everything that we do to ensure that the changes that we're making are truly improvements. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about a journey that we had to really improve our culture of safety at Tufts and how that um, ultimately impacted patient safety. Um, so we, we implemented a number of different interventions really geared towards creating a culture where everybody can speak up if they have a safety concern across the organization. We think it's so important that the people that are really boots on the ground experiencing um, our, their workflow are the ones that are really driving change. And we really want to hear from everyone when they have a safety concern because we think that's the best way that we can improve our processes. Um, so we instituted a series of interventions, including huddles on all the medical units so that we could talk about um, things that happen the last 24 hours, if there are ever any safety concerns, any new protocols or processes that we're rolling out in the next 24 hours so that we could prepare everyone and learn from them. Um, um, we funneled that up to a high reliability briefing where we had leaders from across the organization all reporting out from local huddles and making sure that we were all learning from each other. Um, we instituted a good catch program to really um, reward people for reporting and make sure um, that we are actually thanking people for putting, um, putting these event reports in because people are concerned that speaking up might be punitive and really um, we want to celebrate that and learn for how we can fix our processes. Um, so when we really in implemented this bundle, we saw actually we went a year without having any serious safety events in our children's hospital um, as a result of these interventions and then started spreading them across um, to the, the adult side of our hospital as well. Um, so it really was very impactful and um, we're able to drive change through these processes. Yeah, that's uh, so first off, I mean, whether we're talking about our industry, my, my industry or your industry, you know, a year with no incidents is is impressive for everybody. So so great job on that. And congratulations. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm interested in, I guess, a little more about kind of how it is that that you do, I guess, implement some of these changes, how it what what KPIs it is that you're looking at and what what quality looks like truly in measuring this, benchmarking it in, in affecting any level of change in your industry as well because you know in in the industrial sector obviously and really all things quality right, KPIs are critical so so how do you all address this and what are you looking at in the medical industry yeah, so I, I imagine that our KPIs are a little bit different <laughs> than what you're looking at. Um, really centered on a lot of patient level outcomes. So um, we look at things like medication errors, um, whether we have certain hospital acquired infections, infections that um, patients are picking up while they're under our care in the hospital. Um, we look at things like length of stay and mortality um, for our patients and um, really d track that and benchmark nationally. So we, we have some um, risk adjustments that we can do as part of our uh, national collaborative so that we can benchmark ourselves against other academic medical centers. Um, and really data needs to be at the heart of all that we do because when we implement changes, we can't really tell if they're an improvement if they're actually an improvement if we aren't looking at the data. Um, so typically we track our data longitudinally over time so that when we implement different interventions, we can see the effect of those interventions. I mean, that, that's such a critical component about about all things, I guess, quality in general, right, is you have to have some level of understanding of where you started, what changes you made, and, you know, be able to measure that same thing in the outcomes. Uh, in, in studying for this this episode, I, I was looking at and, and saw that a lot of this kind of originates out of the work of what Florence Nightingale in the 1800s, uh, which is the, the interesting component about that is she was also a statistician, so uh, yeah, so that which kind of reiterates this point of uh, the importance of of good metrics. So you're saying that that you know you're really looking at the outcomes as far as what it is that that the patients are receiving in the end of this, right? It's not just kind of uh, intra-visit, it's, it's overall through the life cycle care of, of the patients. Uh, so how is it that, that you all kind of dissect that down and see what it, I guess, group that in between what it is that's the responsibility of maybe the providers or of the hospital itself and, and kind of affect that change? 
Yeah. So um, one of the godfathers of quality improvement that we always look at um, in healthcare is Edward Deming. And he said, trusting God, all others bring data. So like you really need the data to drive change. And um, we do look at our outcome data, as you said, like what's the ultimate effect on the patient, but it's also important to have process measures. So when we're rolling out um, an intervention, we might see that the outcome's improving, but if we don't track each step in the process and make sure that the interventions that we're carrying out are happening in an effective, uh, reliable way, um, in a standardized way, then we don't know that the changes that we made are ultimately driving those outcomes. So we usually try to have a cadre of um, both outcome measures and process measures so that we can really tell that the interventions that we're that we're implementing are happening in a reliable way and driving those outcomes. And then sometimes we look at balancing measures too. And when we look at balancing measures, those are really the unanticipated um, outcomes of the interventions that we're implementing. So it might be that we're implementing a particular intervention that actually adds time to the process. And so we might be reducing efficiency while improving safety. And we really want to track those balancing measures, one, so that we don't actually cause a problem when we're implementing change. Um, But two, because it's really important to get buy-in, as I'm sure you know in your industry as well, sometimes um, actually getting um, people to modify their behaviors can be quite challenging. And so when we look at all those different aspects, it sometimes can help us get buy-in when we're sharing the data with our colleagues. Um, And then you were talking about how this funnels down to all members of the team. So really, I think part of my job in quality and patient safety and my colleagues is to get data in front of our people that are doing the work um, so that they can see the impact of the interventions that they're putting in place and how important their work is to the quality and safety of the patients that they care for. Um, Because everyone comes to work wanting to really you know, take care of patients, do their best. And so we want to make it easy for them to do the right thing and really um, be able to motivate them to understand the impacts of the interventions that we're asking them to carry out. Yeah, I think that's, that's extremely valuable to think about, not just, I guess, you know, a lot of people will focus on the start. This is the change that we need to implement, but you're saying, you know, really driving that through, through the whole life cycle of the implementation, coming with, with robust data to be able to help support these decisions. And also that, that gives people a, a good, I guess, a good feeling that you've thought of we'll say quote air quotes everything right that that you're not just lobbing this out there saying hey we're going to make this change as seemingly a knee jerk reaction no you have in fact you know considered all of these these kind of externalities uh so that it's not it's not coming from left field right that it's really a substantiated a well supported decision yeah and i I'd like to you know we'll we'll pick back up later about talking about the different personalities definitely uh but <laughs> cuz that's I imagine we have some some similarities there, uh, but one of the things one of the things that I think is interesting that you just brought up also is, you know, implementing change like this sometimes does come at the detriment of another area. Uh, I was listening to a couple of different podcasts on on medical quality improvement. Again, just kind of trying to get prepared for this episode because while we do have some similarities, these are these are drastically different uh, different industries. And it was interesting to hear there are a bunch of different you know kind of stakeholders that are trying to implement other uh, key performance indicators out there in order to to try to we'll say provide the most robust quality out there, but sometimes it comes at too much of a cost uh, for the, the duration of the stay for the patient, how long uh, the, 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 the turnaround time for the patient visits, uh, or even, even potentially the, the service of care, the level of care that you're able to provide to the patients. How do you balance, we'll say, adding in another KPI or having a, we'll say, a robust quality program with, you know, efficiency, with, you know, the the turnaround time for patients, because where it is that you do start having longer and longer lag times, well, well, now it is that you're potentially butting out somebody else from being able to get in altogether. So that, that dramatically impacts all of this. So how do you address that balance? Sure. Um, and th- that's why I think it's important to have really a portfolio of KPIs. So you're looking at the different um, aspects that you're trying to drive the needle on, um, but really to have a few North Stars that, that you're really focused on. And then I think those balancing measures are critical. So like you said, you have to understand the impact of your work and you might be doing that in a number of different ways. Um, what 
you have your hard metrics where you, that you have the data on, but sometimes you have soft metrics too. And I think it's really important to be talking to our frontline staff, the people that are actually doing the work, understand how it impacts their workflow, what are they seeing. And so often we'll roll out changes uh, as small tests of change, learn from them, tweak, and then implement at a larger scale. Um, that way we can ensure that the process is really tight before we're rolling it out across the entire organization. That's a really interesting way of thinking about it in the sense of uh, kind of like the, 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 the Facebook, uh, you know, what is it, work fast and break things, right? You know, let, let's, let's iterate a whole bunch at a smaller scale before we roll this out at a, at a broader level. So that's, a, you know, taking that same approach and implementing change. That's a, uh, you know, that carries with it, we'll say, some level of, of risk, but it also de-risks everything else that you're doing before you cascade this out broadly. And you might think about it actually in terms of how much risk there is. So something that's really risky um, to implement um, and you think maybe people are a little bit more resistant to implement, you might want to roll out in a smaller test of change to kind of get data behind you, get some buy-in and then go big. Whereas something that's maybe less risky and you think people will be easily bought into, you might roll out at a large scale right off the bat. Yeah, that's a good way of approaching it. You know, uh, you, you keep bringing up this idea of getting buy-in, all of the different stakeholders that you have from whether it is that we're talking about the nurses or, you know, the, the physicians themselves, really anybody else in, in the, uh, like the medical administration, anybody, again, who is a stakeholder in this, how is it that you navigate the personalities, right? Because you're working with people that are... Now, you know, very proficient, high-level uh, uh, professionals in a given field. They went to school just as as you did, right? You went to school for an extremely long amount of time to learn your craft. And you know that when when again preparing for this episode, I uh, I was thinking to uh, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine. He's an anesthesiologist, and he's from from what he says, he's very good at what he does. He's very proud of the work that he does, uh, and and commits to providing the highest level of care that he possibly can. And he's a very bright guy. We've known each other quite a long, a long time. And I couldn't possibly imagine going to Chris and saying, Chris, you, you need to change what it is that you're doing, right? <laughs> so how do, you, how do you manage those different personalities uh, in order to, again, affect change? I think a big part of that is having um, an initial improvement team that has by or has involvement of all different key stakeholders. So I try to put together a team that would probably have Chris on it or one of his colleagues, right? Actually have anesthesiologists have at the table. We're making a change in the OR. I might have surgeons there, um, OR nurses, um, some of the surgical techs. And I really want the idea to come from them, honestly. I see myself as a facilitator. They understand their processes best. I bring a quality lens and an idea of um, really what a strong intervention is. So rather than dictate to people, I really want them involved in the process. And people tend to have a lot more buy-in when they feel like it's their idea and they're bringing forward the interventions. Um, and then the other component is really um, when I think about getting buy-in, I bring data because I think that's really important and people um, are motivated by that data. I bring stories. So if it's about something that um, a process in the OR that's really impactful, you know, listen, we want to make sure that um, we have all of our specimens labeled correctly because ultimately this is going to be really important in diagnosing a patient cancer, for example, right? So um, having actual patient stories is really important to get buy-in. And the last part is the what's in it for me piece. And I think that's where having some of those balancing measures showing that maybe something that we're doing actually improves it, efficiency for them or could actually make their life easier um, is really important in terms of getting buy-in. So I think having those three components is really key and then having the right people at the table. Um, and as I said, I, I really want them to originally the idea. So I'm trying to facilitate everybody at the table having a voice and really participating in that. And also having them be champions for the project. If I go and tell a bunch of nurses what to do, it's not as impactful as one of the nurses coming forward and saying, hey, this is a really great idea. Why don't we try to implement this in our unit? It's, I've seen it work in another unit, for example. Um, so that's really important to have the local champions as well. 
Yeah, I, I can definitely see the overlap as how it is, again, in, we'll say in, in the world of industrial construction of having the buy-in from the, the boots on the ground level uh, and and having them involved in the we'll say procedure rewriting and the investigatory process for an RCA uh, and, and for really driving that level of, of change for, for all things quality and safety implementation. Yeah, that's... Yeah, you see, so there is. There's a there's a tremendous amount of overlap in our industries. Yeah, you, you wouldn't think it until we start talking about this and kind of breaking it down a bit. Uh, so then, heaven forbid, something something does, I guess, happen in your industry. Kind of, what is your root cause analysis process, and and how is it that uh, you approach these situations in order to get down to uh, the the root cause of what it is that happened and to to drive change to assure that this doesn't happen again? Sure. So, you know, unfortunately, some errors do happen in the, medi- in the medical in- industry as they do in construction. And um, really, we want to, as you said, make sure that we fully understand the problem so that we can devise a very strong action plan to prevent it from happening in the future. Um, so we usually have an initial huddle in the first 24 to 48 hours that make sure that we identify if there's any immediate mitigating factors that we need to put in place. Um, and then we do a full root cause analysis. So we'll interview all the people involved in the event, make sure that we understand, sometimes even recreate um, an aspect of the event so that we can learn from it. Um, And then we put an action plan together. Um, We try to think about strength of interventions. That's another part that I try to help facilitate. A lot of times when there's an error, people want to do education, and we know that education isn't actually a strong intervention. Um, When we think about human factors engineering, you know, Policies and education are kind of on a, the low end of the spectrum, um, but really when you put in things like forcing functions, um, things that make it easier for people to do the right thing, harder to do the wrong thing, uh, really leveraging technology, that's where um, you can really get to the uh, safer solution. So we really want to make sure that all of our interventions are strong interventions, and then we audit those interventions. We want to make sure that if we're implementing them, that they're actually happening as intended, that we put in a standardized process and make sure that we're really driving change in terms of that outcome. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh, I think the easy the easy answer is like you said, kind of education around that. But really thinking outside of the box and, and maybe uh, reaching out. Do you do you ever reach out to? We'll say in my world, to be reaching out to other projects. But do you ever reach out to to other medical centers, other other uh, practices, in order to see how it is that they address similar situations and and how do how do you I guess perform that outreach if you do. Yeah, so, so definitely I've talked to colleagues at other organizations about interventions that they've put in place. Um, and we also searched the literature. So there's a lot of medical literature around quality and patient safety. And um, in quality, we have a phrase that we steal shamelessly. It's always okay. Like everybody wants to keep patients safe, right? So it's okay to pull from other people and do what they've been doing and make sure that we're learning and spreading that knowledge. Um, so I, I think that's really key. I, um, it's very important to reach out to others, as you said, and do your background research and make sure that you're seeing what the newest things are that are out there and what you can implement to keep patients safe. Yeah, that's something that that you know we tend to on project, and maybe it's out of the the virtue of we're we're working seventy, eighty, ninety hours a week, and we don't necessarily have time to to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, how's everything going on your project? Uh, you know, we're we're all just down in the, down in the firefight day in day out, but uh, that's something that that we don't I feel we don't do a great job of is is reaching out to to our peers on on other projects in order to see what it is that they're doing what what problems are they having and you know what is it that they're doing in order to to kind of ameliorate ameliorate some of those issues or potentially even whether or not they've had some of the same issues that we are having right uh and they've been trying to do that more and more in healthcare. There's um, something called patient safety organizations that a lot of hospitals are joining. Um, and there are national groups that are actually federally protected in terms of um, HIPAA and the legal aspect of medical errors um, so that people can share errors that have happened in their hospitals and also share some of these lessons learned and action plans. Really, the goal is to accelerate patient safety. Um, so Tufts Medical Center that I work at just um, created a patient safety 
organization for our system, Tufts Medicine, so that we can share across our sister hospitals and make sure that we're learning from all of our events. Um, so it's really a great way to, um, to really collaborate and make sure that patients are safe. And it's one of the things I always admired about the nuclear power industry. Whenever I'm talking about high reli reliability, I talk about nuclear power. And they always, um, when they have an error, do an RCA and then actually share it out across all the other power plants in the country. And I just think, you know, it'd be so cool if we could really get there in healthcare to be able to share uh, all those lessons learned. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Oftentimes we get, it's like we take these these incidents personally, uh, whether or not we whether or not we even were directly involved in it, uh, we we seem to take them personally and get get embarrassed by it rather than saying, "Hey, everybody, listen, this is what happened to me, or this is what happened to somebody on my project uh, or at at my medical facility." Uh, Please learn from this to assure that we don't ever do this again, which is, in my opinion, is the right approach. We need to uh, do what we can. Uh, you know, uh, a smart man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from somebody else's. Uh, so let's let's all help everybody be a little bit wiser to learn from the mistakes that we've already made. So I couldn't agree with that more. Um, and we have had some employees here that have really embraced that. So, you know, a, a nurse that had a medication error, for example, and shares it with all of her colleagues in her department. Um, and that's really great because, as you said, people often take this really personally. No one wants to make a mistake. Everyone's here to do good. And so, you know, we do have some peer support programs in place, too, to help people after um, there's been an event. But really, we see that those people are often the best safety champions when they go for it and they're willing to talk to other people about their error and we can share so much and learn together. So it's really great. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've seen similar things in, in our industry where the people who have oftentimes some of the worst stories, right? But the best stories as far as an example goes, but you know, they're just, they're just devastating stories whenever it comes to a safety incident. Uh, they're the ones that end up, as long as they step forward and they own that, they become the best champions for a better way. And you hate to see it because the cost that it took in order to 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 have that occur but you know it's at the same time making the best out of a terrible situation so again whatever we can do in order to share lessons is is great uh this actually segues into a, something i wanted to, to ask about which earlier on in the episode you had said that you know kind of fostering that that relate that uh, that atmosphere and environment where people can come forward and you know, bring up issues really before maybe they be they turn into a safety incident of some sort. Uh, how is it that you approach kind of building that culture to where people are feeling like they can approach you with some level of issue or with with some concern that they may have? Yeah. So, you know, people are nervous sometimes to come forward with safety concerns. And that's why we really have to make sure that people understand that any concerns that are raised are a learning opportunity. And I can't fix a problem that I don't know about. Um, so we have a couple ways to come forward in the hospital. We actually have a, a reporting system where if there's um, an error, a near miss, something that maybe goes wrong that doesn't actually reach a patient, but signifies a small signal in the system. Um, we can find out about those and act on them to drive change. And then people can raise safety concerns right um, in the moment, right? You might see your colleague do something that's unsafe. Might for, they might forget to wash their hand before procedure and you just need to speak up and say something to them right in the moment. And that's sometimes hard for people to do because they aren't sure how that'll be received. So um, I'm actually teaching a course across the organization about what it means um, to be in a high reliability organization and how to broach these these concerns with colleagues because they are uncomfortable. Um, so we talk about, you know, first asking a question, raising something in a nonchalant way, and then how you might escalate and then actually make a request. And if you need to go up the chain of command. Um, but part of that course is actually setting key expectations for all of our employees across the hospital. One, that we all own safety, that it really belongs to all of us. Um, two, that we need clear and complete communication. I'm sure um, in your teams as well, it's so critical that the team that's working together is communicating. Um, we're all doing a lot of high-risk procedures and processes, and we need to make sure that we're all on the same page at all times. Um, and the last part is having a questioning attitude. That really means, one, raising a question if you have a concern. We know in medicine, the data shows us 
is that before an error reaches a patient, it's actually made it through eight or nine people in that process. And people might have felt a little uncomfortable, but maybe they didn't speak up because the attending doctor was there or there was a senior nurse present and they thought, oh, they couldn't make a mistake. Um, but we really want people to just ask the question, start the dialogue, and we should all pause and make sure that everything's okay before proceeding. Um, but what we also teach the flip side of having a questioning attitude is being okay with having your practice questioned. So if someone comes to me with a safety concern and I dismiss them, they're not speaking up again, right? That's they they think that I'm not receptive and they don't feel comfortable. Uh, but we all need to create an environment where it's okay to speak up because we all have a common goal of keeping patients safe and keeping our colleagues safe. And we have to work together to do that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more that everybody needs to take kind of an approach of, we'll say humility in whatever it is that they're doing uh, so that they, they can learn, right? Even even the best in whatever field you were talking about out there. Uh, Michael Jordan in his prime still had multiple specialist coaches because he knew that he could get better, right? We can all improve off of where we are. So uh, you have to be, you have to understand that there's room for improvement before you can approach that. So that's great. Exactly. And I don't know about the construction industry, but medicine has traditionally been pretty hierarchical. Um, and another thing that we learned from higher reliability looking at other um, areas is that really we have to flatten that hierarchy, right? So like in the airline industry, there's a lot of work done around making it okay for co-pilots to speak up to pilots when they had concerns because there used to be a lot of hierarchy there and people weren't willing to do that. Similarly, on aircraft carriers, you know, anybody is charged with speaking up and stopping the line and they, again, thank people and applaud them for doing so because one small move could signify a huge problem um, that could really... Um, um, cause loss of life. And so it's really the same thing for us. You know, any aspect of medicine really could have a devastating consequence if there's an error. And so we really want to make sure that everything we're doing is safe and that we're keeping our colleagues safe and our patients safe. Yeah, that goes also back to kind of how it is that you're managing personalities. And it's, it's, it's great that you're, that you're having that, that internal course on how to address these situations. Uh, that can oftentimes be, especially especially in my industry, one of the most difficult things. We're all, you were saying it, right? We're, we're all trying to do the best job we can. Nobody, I've, I've said it, I've heard it from many different people. You know, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to go to work and do a bad job. So we all go with the best of intentions. We all want to put forward an honest days of living and to do the best we can. So when we're challenged on that, you know, it, it, I see why it is that we would take it personally, right? We, we think that we're doing the right thing and somebody's coming through and accusing us of something otherwise, but we have to be able to, to learn from each other as best we can. And if you are speaking up, you need to be able to do it with some tact, <laughs> right? Because likely you're going to be met with, with some level of resistance. Uh, with that though, you know, one of the things that can happen that I've seen happen in my industry is that we get we get very focused on we'll say abiding by the procedures which I was a quality individual for for years the procedures are there for a reason however we don't want to stifle innovation right uh how is it that that you all balance between we'll say adherence to the SOPs uh with the ability in order for for somebody to to innovate and excel and with that how do you all you know because when thinking about some of the, when thinking about quality you, sometimes you end up getting this connotation of you're punishing people to do bad not necessarily how are you rewarding people for doing well so so how do you again balance the the sop with the innovations and also how do you reward the people that are really excellent at what it is that they do? Who are those, those high performers? Um, so that's a great question because we, we do have policies and standard procedures that are, are really vital, right, to keep our employees safe and keep our patients safe. And so we certainly want people to adhere to those. Um, and we want to do it in a, a non-punitive way. So that we um, have a 
what we call a just culture, right? So we, we don't want to punish people when they make a mistake if what they're doing was with good intention. Um, but we want to make sure that we're kind of doing our mini root cause analysis there to say, why did they actually deviate from that procedure, right? And it might be that it's uh, like a normalized deviance, like everybody in this unit is doing the workaround. And that means that the process is broken and we need to figure out how we actually fix that process. Maybe their workaround isn't ideal. Maybe it creates some risk, right? But then we need to, as, as you said, innovate and fix the process and look at other opportunities for change. Um, I like to think that we reward change, you know, but the other part of our Department of Quality and Patient Safety is a, a group of process improvement specialists. Um, and we really are trying to do a lot of different um, initiatives across the organization to have that innovation, um, reward that intervention, uh, innovation, sorry, and bring change through intervention. So um, we, when we have, you know, people that are doing the work, different doctors and nurses that might see a new process that they think would be better, um, often they'll bring that to our team and they'll ask for help from the performance improvement department. How do we actually implement this? You know, what can we do to drive change? Um, and we help them come up with metrics and track that. So we really do try to encourage innovation. Um, I think the leaders in our organization appreciate the innovation and we've actually had some quality improvement grants that we give out to give some funding for um, new projects. And we, but as part of that, as we said, data is so important. We expect people to come back and present us with the data and show us what they've done um, with that money. Yeah, that's a, uh, again, excellent approach, having, rooting this in uh, not just kind of, we'll say something qualitative, but really quantitative, right? Because at the end of the day, if you if you can't quantify it, we haven't really changed much of anything. So uh, that's great that you all keep such a, an open uh, mindset whenever it comes to really that that these that these processes aren't written in stone that that there's always room for improvement and that it is that you're that you're looking for opportunities in order to really increase the standard of care for all of your patients uh coming from the providers that's fantastic Dr. Dudles, I think we're we're coming up kind of close toward the end of our discussion here, we're coming up close on time. So I was just going to ask some last minute rapid fire questions to get to get to know uh, more than just Dr. Dudles, get to know Nina a little bit. Uh, so first question is, what continues to motivate you in your career? Um, really, the mission. I just want to make quality better for our patients and their families. Um, so that really keeps me coming to work every day, excited to do the work I do. That's excellent. Uh, what is the one word that best describes you? Um, I think an accelerator. I think my job, as I said, is to facilitate amongst others and really be able to accelerate change. Uh, what is the, your idea of a perfect vacation? Um, relaxing on the beach. I don't get to relax a ton, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, um, that's my, my ideal. Yeah, so the idea is just, is just an off switch, right? Off <laughs> switch, exactly. That's Separate it. a little bit. Right. Uh, what is your favorite book? Um, I, I think I'm going to geek out a little bit here, but we were talking about high reliability. So uh, Managing the Unexpected is a really great book, kind of a, looking at a number of different industries, figuring out what really um, was successful in creating principles of high reliability. So I'll, I'll go with that. Excellent. I'll have to look that up. Uh, what is your favorite quote? Um, Be the change you wish to see in the world. I have it behind me on my shelf. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, what is your dream job? Um, I want to be a chief quality officer when I grow up in, in a hospital <laughs> or hospital system. It was a pleasure having this conversation with you. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and, uh, and educating our guests on this topic. It was really wonderful to speak with you as well. Thanks so much. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of the Work Done Right podcast. Please help us out by subscribing and leaving us a review. And as always, our show notes are linked in this episode's description. Thank you for listening and see you next time.